Okay, moving on. Moving on uh, to the I suppose the first of the the two, the two big chunks that were that were recording um, this month uh, with, with this specific focus in mind, and that is first of all we want to to really revisit and properly add to and explore the Bosworth uh, Field uh, yes. story. Uh, so this is this is the story that's. It's important, uh, and it, it will be made and have international implications eventually. Uh, but it starts as a small planning issue, yes. and and it seems to to now have have gained some momentum, and the implications of it are yet really, I think, to fully play out. So uh, you may have seen the, the the special bulletin that we did. Uh, we will be repeating a little bit of that, but today I, I think we wanted just to talk about it um, with a bit more time and let it breathe a bit more. So. Uh, Shall we begin with with the fact that this starts with a small planning, uh, a small planning process? I guess it, it starts with a small, absolutely bog standard planning application mm -hmm. under the English planning system, under what's called the National Planning Policy Framework, mm. whereby anybody who wants to undertake uh, a development that is legally regulated makes a planning application to the local planning authority which is basically the local council the local community mm -hmm. you know elected community body mm -hmm. um and it goes through a set process um which includes input for uh, on, on various levels from the impact on traffic to the impact on the local resources such as education school you know schools pharmacies and doctor surgeries if it's about building housing and, and so on and so on and so on and it includes um, environmental impact assessments EIAs uh, based on the potential impact to the natural, natural environment and to the heritage environment the archaeology and the history of the area and and it's worthwhile noting that typically is the extent of the the remit is environment and heritage uh, heritage assets I guess okay that's right. yeah that's right so and, and and this is all governed under another principle which comes from European law, mm -hmm. um, European uh, environmental law, and that is the principle that the polluter pays. Mm. In other words, if somebody wants to do something that's going to damage the natural environment or the heritage environment or both, or impact on the number of school places that are available and or or, or uh, the number of uh, you know, people that might be wanting to attend a doctor's surgery, then they have to pay. For the mitigation of that of, of, of those impacts yeah. so they might have to pay for a new doctor surgery or a new primary school or a roundabout to mitigate the impact of something or yeah uh, but, but also in this instance it's worthwhile saying as well just to, just in the name of, of again letting this story breathe a little bit in this instance polluter is not just as we might think littering or something it's not it's not adding to it's also taking yeah. away from so Precisely. it can be the destruction of a site as well as leaving something behind that there wasn't that's originally there. That, that, that's exactly right. So, yeah. so that's 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 the legal background. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, what has happened in Hinckley and Bosworth, which is a local authority in the English East Midlands in Leicestershire, is that a very large high-tech company called Horiba Mira, mm -hmm. which is currently owned uh, in, in Japan, in fact, uh, has something called the the Mira Technology Park, an enterprise zone. It's a, it, basically, it's a former airfield which has been given over to developing high-tech research facilities related to the motor industry. The English Midlands is a centre of the, uh, and has been a centre of the automotive industry for over a century now. Um, particularly towns like Coventry and Birmingham and, uh, and Derby have been associated with high-tech industries and um, companies like Rolls-Royce and uh, the, the various other automotive companies, Jaguar, Land Rover and so on. I'm just smiling because I, I, I wasn't old enough really to remember some of these these little gems being produced by people like Leyland, but uh, I've I've been in some of these these old British cars from the, that part of the world, and some of them aren't, aren't the best. <laughs> well, I think by a lot of uh, a, a lot of votes uh, in 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 uh, Top Gear type magazines, the Austin Allegro of the 1970s is reckoned to be one of the worst worst cars ever designed and built. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, that, and that includes former Soviet bloc machines as well. I mean, that's impressive. It, it, doesn't, it, does, it doesn't even have the kudos of owning an original Lada. No, uh, no. No, absolutely. But, um, anyway, uh, what's happened now? It, obviously, um, particularly with 
the government looking to develop British industry, particularly with the government looking to develop uh, British industry post Brexit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is we will come on to later. Mm -hmm. um, the industries like uh, um, like the tech industries are being heavily promoted by the government at the moment. Yes, um, and the other factor, just um, filling in the last piece of background is that in the that particular area are a number of universities including the University of Coventry and the University of Leicester who have a very strong research angle research arm working in collaboration with automotive companies hmm. which in the context of Brexit is something that the universities cannot afford to compromise they need, they need to keep this this stuff in place um, uh, in order to uh, arguably in order to survive yeah Absolutely. There is a lot of time and effort and particularly money has been invested in these links. Yeah. yeah. What happened earlier on this year is that an application was submitted by Horiba Mira mm -hmm. to build a test track for autonomous vehicles, driverless cars. It's one of the growth areas in, in, in tech and in automotive tech. People might have read about. You know, every everybody is um, work, developing autonomous vehicles, autonomous drones. We've heard, you know, Amazon have claimed that they're developing an autonomous drone to deliver your Amazon delivery. Mm -hmm. um, I'm developing one in the shed. I <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, so it is, it it is a, basically yeah. it's a, an autonomous archaeo suit that means we don't have to try and link our schedules up, and it just go, yeah. goes on. And, yeah. and actually, you and I can we can we can scan ourselves as holograms, and it can just get on with it, and we can get on with our lives. That'd be yeah. great fun. Yeah, until it crashes into the side of a truck. But you know, uh, that, so anyway, so the point is, yeah, and, and also actually yeah. with with that in mind, actually accidents like. Uh, or infamous accidents like in California where, where you have had cars drive into the side of the trucks because they don't recognise that the side is not the sky. Um, yep. uh, Allegedly. A pop, a, well, no, 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 that, that was actually, that was confirmed as, as the problem. In that my, instance. My, 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 my legal friend is saying it allegedly. Okay, fair enough. Um, and, uh, but, but the point is, is that another aspect of this is that in Britain as well, we're trying, or it's been announced that we're going to be post-Brexit making the uh, the standards and the, the the laws surrounding these sort of testing of vehicles uh, more development friendly as opposed to necessarily being as strict as and safety conscious necessarily as as the European Union would have them absolutely yeah. but the, the, the thing is this, this test track and, and, and they're talking about um, I think it's 23 24 million uh, or so that this thing is going to cost um, it's designed for them to be able to run these autonomous vehicles to test the control systems, mm -hmm. to run them at realistic speeds. Yes. Um, but in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate piece of industrial infrastructure that arguably is necessary for the development of an important part of the industry. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the plan as presented to Hinckley and Bosworth Council included the destruction of part of the registered battlefield of Bosworth. The mm. Battle of Bosworth is one of the probably the three most important battles to have taken place on English or British soil. Mm -hmm. Battle of Hastings in 1066 which saw the end of Saxon Britain and the beginning of, uh, of, of, of Norman England. Mm -hmm. um, the Battle of Culloden in 1746, which ended the uh, attempts of the, uh, of, of the House of Stuart to return to the English throne and, and really cemented the relationship between England and, and, and Scotland mm -hmm. and, the union, and the Union. Um, and Bosworth in 1485, in August 1485, which saw the end of the Plantagenet dynasty and the death of Richard III. And really, a lot of historians would argue, the beginning of modern imperial Britain with the accession of Henry the Seventh, Henry Tudor, who I understand was Welsh, whatever that means, um, and, um, uh, and and Henry is he, he invests in John Cabot's uh, voyages to Newfoundland and and, and, and so on, and, and bring it, and, and by a hundred years later, when Elizabeth the the, the first is on the throne, Henry the Seventh's granddaughter. Um, England is a major European and imperial power. Yeah, and, Eng and England and Spain really are competing for, 
who, in, go, who goes next. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. England, Spain and France are in this sort of conflicting triangle, yeah. um, which lasts for the next 200 years. So yeah. very, very important um, moment in history. The battlefield is now one of the most intensely studied in the country mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. um, and it's well known for, amongst other things, the work that's been done really in the last 10 years uh, by Glenn Ford and his team has shown that the original site of the battlefield was wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, back in the 1970s, uh, Leicester County Council built a, a visitor centre um, to take advantage of the, um, the site of the Battle of Bosworth and the, the site of where, the, uh, on, on a place called Ambien Hill where Richard III, III charged down to his death in an attempt to save his crown and so on. Absolutely wrong. It's about two miles away from where the battle was actually fought mm -hmm. because archaeology has shown, thanks to finds, and in particular the finds of gunshot, cannon shot, that the battle was on an area um, roughly straddling the old Roman road. Mm. Uh, which makes sense because that's that, that, that those would have been the roads that the armies, two armies, used to approach each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and um, the battle is in. Uh, it, it, put it this way: when, when the research was uh, announced in 2009, the then regional inspector for English heritage, historic England, as now is, um, told the told the press, "This is the second epic victory of, uh, on Bosworth's history-steeped soil." It has taken more than 500 years to reveal one of Leicestershire's greatest and most elusive secrets, but this is a world-class example of what can be received through archaeological research. Mm. So that's how important it is. It's world-class world work on an internationally important site. It's the largest assemblage of medieval cannon and gunshot anywhere in Europe. Mm. Mm. And, there's, and there is likely to be more to come. Mm. Now, the argument is that a registered battlefield, which Bosworth now is, should be beyond development. It should be so, seen as so nationally important that it's not touched. However, the decision is given over to local planners, and local planners have an instruction to balance harm to heritage against the economic benefits to their population which now, now and this this is where it gets complicated because uh as i say oh as i was saying at the beginning of this this segment the, the that is not one of typically one of the remits of of the people who would do this sort of analysis uh, the arche an archaeological unit for example is tasked with identifying what what is or what might be there uh, depending yeah. on what has been paid for if it's a desk-based assessment then it's maps and photos yeah. and past, yeah. past archaeological excavations that are analyzed and, and collated and if there is an, ele an element of excavation then that's also part of that but the point is, is is seeing what's there and seeing how that might be damaged by the proposed development not not talking about or not even even casting an opinion about uh, the economic benefits of the, of said development for example as you were touching on you know the development uh, or an excavation or a desk based assessment ahead of the development of a supermarket it's, the archaeologist's job is not to say well i think that that walmart or asda or whatever will will really sit well in the landscape here and, and it's going to be great for local people that's not the archaeologist's job at all okay Okay, so what's, what happened? What has happened here is that Hariba Mira have submitted their planning application. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, as is quite proper, uh, appointed a consultant, mm -hmm. and as is also quite proper, that consultant has appointed an archaeological contractor. And the archaeological mm -hmm. contractor, in this case, has been the University of Leicester Archaeological Services. All perfectly legitimate, and sitting outside of those, uh, that that line of management is the national regulator which is historic england and historic england makes sure that the work is of a suitable standard um it specifies what needs to be done to conform with heritage law and um and, and also makes comments to the planning authority i.e hinckley and bosworth but it has no other remit than to comment it can't say yes or no to an application and here <laughs> we come to another bit where you're going to be going allegedly um yes. but nonetheless i i think here we it's worthwhile touching upon two complicating factors or, or potentially even compromising factors mm. the first one is that the leicester unit uh is associated with leicester university 
it's yes, an integral part. If you look at the website, it's an integral part of the school of ancient history and classics. Especially since the discovery of Richard III. So these, it's, these guys it's been have, it's, exactly it's an internationally known archaeological body which has done some terrific work that you yeah. know it, it, it is a it, it's a, a it's an organization which is registered with the chartered institute for archaeologists mm-hmm. it, it, it follows uh, it is stated it will follow CIFA's ethical codes mm-hmm. and disciplinary codes and so on it's an absolutely above board archaeological body but well, 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 and actually, on that note as well, they're also they also seem to be lovely people. I once just sort of stumbled in saying, "Can you give me some finds bags?" And they they gave me some, and I never gave them the whiskey that I promised them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they seem to be lovely people. So it's not in that sense. This isn't about them. As if this is about the 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 potential for a conflict of interest, and so much as the people overseeing their work will be will be undeniably aware of the fact that that the, the university is 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 relying upon this sort of development to go ahead for its financial um, security put it this way uh the university of leicester has documented and there's a, a, we'll post the link to the pipelines investigation into this below the line but the uh the university has long-standing links with horiba mira mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, in, 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 and research links, uh, links where they share staff for lecturing duties and, and, and tutoring and mentoring duties, um, and they're part of a uh, they're part of an education initiative on the Hori Bamira Enterprise Zone Technology Park. Yes. So you know there there, there is a a long standing relationship there which involves support in cash and kind. Yeah, and, and also. Uh... Hariba Mira are confident enough uh, in what they're proposing that they didn't actually modify their plans no. uh, when it came. When people were asking, "Can you put, just revisit this this plan in terms of its sensitivity?" They didn't. They just waited six weeks or whatever, and then resubmitted exactly the same plans. So, so yeah. there, there, there's a question there. It's four quest- weeks actually. Four weeks. Okay. Well, for even less time. Uh, there's a question there in terms of. In fact, they they rebutted all the arguments against the day after the initial. Uh, they had an initial knockback where it was re- deferred to the next planning meeting, which was a month later, and they they re- all the arguments have been rebutted the following day. Right. Right. Well, there you go. There's a, um, que- there's a question there in terms of the archaeological work that's done and the relationship between the institution that the archaeologists are attached to and the economic uh, potential for uh, a, a conflict of interest. Now, what I, what I, and what we must make clear here, Mark, is that there is no suggestion that anybody no, at no. University of Leicester Archaeology Services consciously or deliberately falsified any aspect of the work that they did or biased it in any way no what problem is is the perception of a conflict of interest and that there may have been an unconscious bias um well, certainly. And, 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 and the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists recognises this because in the archaeolo- in, in the CIFA code of conduct there is a clause which says that an archaeologist or an archaeological contractor should have a transparent system mm-hmm. for recognising and dealing with real or perceived Mm -hmm. conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what critics of what has gone on at Hinckley and Bosworth say is that in none of the paperwork that was submitted by ULAS, University of Leicester Archaeological Services, was the relationship between the university and Horiba Mira made clear. No, no. Yes, exactly. So that that sort of thing hasn't, hasn't been explicitly acknowledged. So this brings us to part two of this uh, this analysis, I suppose, of the the process, uh, starting with part one and the and the the, the potential for perception of uh, a, a conflict of interest, in so much as Leicester University undertaking work on a site that Leicester University needs and wants to proceed in some form. Yeah. Part two. If it's not the archaeological process, is actually the 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 final arbiter, the implementation, I guess, of planning uh, policy and the framework for planning policy, in the shape of historic England and and their role in uh, in well, actually, increasingly in facilitating uh, development as opposed to necessarily um, enforcing protection. And uh, so this this is this is another complicating factor, I guess. 
It, it, it absolutely is. Um, back in 2010, when the coalition government came in under David Cameron, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, um, and the Treasury oversaw a split between English heritage um, and what became historic England. Mm. English heritage was hived off as a charity which is meant to be self-supporting by the early 2020s in terms of uh, not needing any government money. Mm -hmm. That got rid of the historic buildings portfolio that had previously been owned and operated by a state body. It includes things like Dover Castle, Stonehenge um, and, and, and every other you know, heritage site that in, in England that people might, might think of. Mm -hmm. um, the regulatory half, the legal part, was, was split and became historic England. Mm. Now, crucially, what Osborne also did was change its remit. Mm. It changed its remit to specifically, quote, support sustainable development. Mm. The reason behind that was perception in the Treasury and other parts of government and, and in uh, the sector... Um, uh, in the business uh, world, for example. In the business world, property mm. developers and so on, who perceived uh, archaeology as part of the... I mean, in fact, archaeology is a tax on development. Mm. Mm. Um, yes. and, and, and a break on development, and potentially a um, something that could stop development. Yeah. Now, the moment, the moment you make, make it arguable that develop, a development is sustainable, you can, you can then argue that every development uh, can go ahead, because every development can be made to look sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what critics say. Mm -hmm. Okay. When it comes to Bosworth, what happened... Uh, really seems to have highlighted the problem this has shown up for uh, anybody who's involved in heritage conservation because what happened was that landscape study that um, I mentioned that was done by the University of Leicester Archaeological Services mm -hmm. said initially that the landscape would be uh, would, would under, uh, undergo substantial harm from the development mm. it would take out a crucial part of what is now understood to be the battlefield of Bosworth mm. So, so the historic understanding of where the battle took place has has is no longer really fully relevant. It's actually shifted and expanded, and that's and right. Really, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and 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 so, what is now the situation is that, uh, and what what has been the source of the criticism, was that um, first of all, let's say that the um, the the battlefield was defined as having would would, un would undergo substantial harm from this development, but this was then morphed into becoming a less uh, a, a lesser harm because they will create a 3d computer model of the area that was destroyed <laughs> and uh, and to add to this uh, to support this they um, also added uh, statistics about the amount of battlefield that would be taken out by this development mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as less than one percent mm -hmm. now Battlefield historians, including Mike, In Mike Ingram, who's written a book about the Battlefield of Bosworth and wrote a piece about it for the Pipeline, uh, he pointed out that the figure was calculated on the whole of the registered battlefield, including the, the old site, which is now no longer understood to be the battlefield, but hasn't been taken out of the registered area. Yeah. So therefore, the actual, uh, actual damage to the battlefield is greater than... is acknowledged. So that, in, that's, like, that's like, if I say I'm going to smash my window here... Yes. Uh, and and we calculate what sort of area in terms of damage to the building that means. That's like yeah. taking into account my neighbour's house as well. Precisely. When actually my neighbour's house has nothing to do with who's going to pay for that window. That yeah. is exactly yeah. right. That's a really good analogy. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, you've got those two things going on. Mm -hmm. You might think that Historic England might pick this up, but they don't. No. You might think that Historic England might question the conflict of interest, but they don't. No. What they do is write two letters to Hinckley and Bosworth Borough Council, one mm -hmm. uh, in front of the original planning meeting in August and another one uh, to go before the planners at the planning meeting at the, in, uh, uh, in, in September, which actually gave the planning consent. And in both of those, they use language which appears to not just accept that the application does limited harm to the registered battlefield, but they also point out the economic benefits that it will bring to the area. Which, now, that yeah. is really, really controversial because yeah. 
archaeologists and independent archaeologists and campaigners about this are absolutely furious because they say that it, even if they've got this remit to support sustainable development, mm -hmm. what they don't have is a remit to say, actually, those figures that have been put before you by the developer, uh, we can abs we, we absolutely concur and we and we support, uh, you know, we can, we can see the... Because the they, the Historic part. England isn't a technology forecaster, no, not, it's not an economics economist. forecasting body. No. It's no. It, but to be honest, the, you know, the economics of the site are absolutely nothing to do with them. Yeah, and yet their voice carries a lot of weight. And so uh, Hinckley and uh, Bosworth Borough Council on Twitter uh, it strongly implied that, that this was one of the, the, the things that allow, allowed this to, to cross the finish line when they tweeted that they had weighed the harm to the designated battlefield against the significant economic benefits that the scheme would deliver. Exactly. Now, uh, uh, there's, there's two things I just want to mention at this point. First of all, I just want to revisit this, this, this very strong caveat. Archaeologists sane archaeologists are not against development no. they're not against making money or building new buildings they're not against making sure that that that, that, that society has a future and um, uh, or, or, or undermining that uh, as it were um, destroying uh, that potential just to protect some stuff in the ground that's not what we're interested in in this instance it's more about the shape and the form of, of these developments and whether or not they could be more sensitively met, done. Mm -hmm. But the second thing as well to, to say here is that there are archaeologists out there who are suggesting that actually this is an opportunity to learn more about the, the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, Mike Pitts um, of uh, British Archaeology, I think the editor in chief uh, has said or is quoted in an article which will again we'll link to below on historyextra.com um, as saying destruction is knowledge. Um, uh, he says that uh, that humans have been uh, living um, here, as it were, in Britain for millions of years. There's not a square inch of land and not much sea that doesn't have history. But the thing is, again, that's not what sane archaeologists are in. And I don't care if Joe Bloggs tripped over once on a patch of ground. Of course, every every square inch, for the most part, really, of Britain has had someone touch it in some form yeah. that's not what i'm what 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 a sane archaeologist is against it's against uh the the destruction and, and the uh, irretrievable um uh nature of this destruction in terms of the battlefield site now mike pitts makes the argument that destruction is knowledge all excavations are destroying a site but in this instance you don't have to do it you know and, and archaeologists also do not relish destroying archaeological sites this is one of the reasons why most archaeology in britain is done ahead of development is because if we don't have to we don't destroy a site we don't dig it up we yes. do remote sensing we do other forms of trying to learn about the battlefield and and so in this argument laid out you know, quite quite sensibly he says that the three options supposedly in a civilized nation block development uh, allow it but ask the developer to do to avoid damaging the historic remains and and point three is allow it and ask the developer to record any threatened remains before work begins or ask the development the developer i suppose in particular to, to pay for an archaeologist to do that mm. um but the, the whole point here is that this doesn't have to happen like this it doesn't have to be we don't have to destroy this and this isn't again this isn't just a place where people happen to have lived this is a very particular place and we know that something well, very special happened there well the the, the 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 current estimate based on the on the latest research is that the site that's going to be destroyed is around 500 meters from the point which was the the the, the, the main uh site at the end of the battle where richard iii was actually killed yeah right oh right okay well they, yeah, exactly and so so it uh, uh, this argument that actually that well this is this is archaeological process in action archaeologists don't unless you're you're a you know you're a, Sch a schleeman or something you're going you know you're looking to 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 make to you know you're thinking in a slightly antiquated kind of way you mm. don't run around looking to destroy a place in order to learn about it uh and that, so that's that's some flawed logic now so so back to the process though um just mm. coming to the end of this segment um in terms of defence, what what uh, what was allowed 
and what were, what what were the mitigating you know arguments that were put well th up? this is this is one of the other um, problems with the uh, with the whole Bosworth process and I think it's why this is going to become something of a test case mm -hmm. um, first of all there are allegations no more than that there are allegations that the planning application was slipped out um, and that for example uh, the major national independent expert body, the Battlefields Trust, only found out about it a few days before it went before the planning committee mm -hmm. in its final form. Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there are allegations that that was deliberate to prevent uh, a, a time for any uh, protest to gather force. Yep. Um, well, but also analysis and reasoned arguments against... Uh, uh, yeah. To be, Absolutely. To be, yeah. for, 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 for there to be any detailed critique of the papers that yeah. were going in front of the planning committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when it came to the actual planning process, and particularly to the planning decision that was made at the end of September, the allegation, well, it's not allegations. What happened was, and again, this is all perfectly legitimate, but three speakers were able to speak on behalf of the application to the planning committee. Mm -hmm. Only one speaker was allowed to speak against the planning application, and they were limited to three minutes. Yes. Yeah. That's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. um, the chair of the planning committee, again, perfectly legitimately, legitimately had declared an interest of, as being a member of the uh, Hori Bermira Liaison Committee with Hinkley and Borough <laughs> Council. Now, yeah. that... That the chair, having declared that interest, along with two other councillors who also declared an interest, were able to take part in the debate and vote. Um, when, when, when really, no, nothing that, that could be said against it was going to sway their argument, sway their votes, basically, with, with a declared you interest. You could say that, I couldn't possibly comment. Okay, okay, sorry. The perception is that, yeah. And so... And so, just 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 to just to really just sort of try and bring this to a close, then, what are the potential implications then? Why why have we why have we rabbited on about this for half an hour or so? In so much as that, and this 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 breakdown has been so necessary. Right. The reason I think this is important, and I think will uh, that th this will run as a story, is I think mm -hmm. there's more to come out about the relationships between the various parties and the back channels that will maybe use to ease the way of this uh, planning application. The, um, the overall um, initiative of which the test track is a part is I think 51 um, million pounds hmm. and two thirds of the money roughly are coming from the government. Right, yeah. Uh, now obviously Historic England is dependent on the government for its funding. Utterly dependent on utterly yeah. dependent on the yeah. government for its funding, yeah. and also for the legislation and the regulation which it, which it supports and yeah. interprets. You know, um, there and there is certainly a perception that the government wants to loosen planning rules once, if, when, and we're going to come to that in a minute. The UK leaves the European Union in March as is currently scheduled. Um, I think the other thing is a, is a deeper question, and it's a worrying question for me, uh, just simply as an archaeologist. Um, I am, and, and, and it's not just this story, it's a number of stories I've been looking at over the last few years. Goodwin Sands is another one we've discussed on Watching Brief, where although they're doing things that are seemingly entirely proper and entirely in line with the legislation, mm -hmm. uh, Organisations like Historic England and some of the contracting bodies and so on are actually complicit in what independent persons, in, indeed independent experts, and we've seen this at Bosworth, we've seen this at Stonehenge, we've seen this at Old Oswestry, they basically say what they're complicit in is actually not conservation but the destruction of, her of heritage, uh, uh, the irretrievable changes mm. to internationally significant aspects of, of, of her heritage and so in a way what we're seeing then is a change not so much in legislation but in in the application of legislation and therefore policy that actually inverts and sorry that serves to invert the relationship between those who are meant to be 
protecting and uh, commenting on the potential damage to historic sites and those who want to see uh, development and therefore tacit damage go ahead it's it's a it, it, and and the 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 webs the connections the 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 lack of mitigation but also the uh the lack of transparency in terms of how vested interests relate to uh the the the, the protectors the gatekeepers means that this this has the potential to really without having to, to have a debate in parliament or without having to actually legislate in a new way to really change the the real world way that historic sites are cared for in Britain. That, that's the point. It, that's the key point. It, two, two, two things really just to finish up this segment. Yeah. Um, one is that um, the point that was made in, 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 the, say in, the, in the pipelines investigation to this, mm -hmm. de facto, historic England has allowed Hinckley and Bosworth Borough Council to redefine the national policy on the conservation of historic battlefields yeah. and the level of harm that can be that can be allowed on a registered battlefield before there's any attempt to intervene to prevent yeah. uh, planning application. And, now, and, and again, just to clarify for international audiences, that's not even a county level authority. That no. would be that's a local borough level authority. Yeah. Um, um, it's a local market town. Yeah, applying and redefining a national policy of yes. protection. Yeah. yeah. Now, now I have to say, um, the uh, Historic England Press Office deny that. Yeah. They deny that's the case. Yeah. Other people are less sanguine about it. And and the, and the, and the final comment, and again, it's purely anecdotal, but it comes from a, a contact, a source I was speaking to, uh, not actually about Bosworth, about something else. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was about the perception of historic England, mm -hmm. and this is a person who has acted um, as an advisor to government and has worked with historic England for many, many years, and um, not just on heritage issues, um, has been involved in in, in uh, various mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, and discussions and so on. And they told me that the perception at the moment among many people who have contact with historic England is, quote, historic England has been captured by Whitehall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're captured, and history is uh, heritage is held hostage in that sense. Yeah. That's the point. The checks and balances are now not within the system where they were meant to be. The checks and balances are now in the people on the outside, the the experts and the campaigning bodies and the pressure groups and so on. Who and and and, and, we, and we're seeing at Bosworth at the moment. There are currently discussions underway as to whether they can t uh, challenge the decision legally and take it to what's called a judicial review on the grounds that the decision was pr and the process was uh, was. Um, not appropriate and, and potentially that the uh, the decision was unsound yeah watch this space yeah and so with that in mind uh we won't return to this story in this depth in the future what we'll do is we'll refer to this segment in the future and we will add to this story as and when for example any judicial review comes across comes up and this sort of thing yeah. so we just wanted to really lay out in in graphic detail all the different Bruce complicating some factors. Detail. Bruce Bruce. Some detail. This, this has been a, a deliberate autopsy, I think, of this, yeah. um, or if not, a, you know, a living autopsy, and uh, because it, it has the potential to be very, very important. So, so that that's why we've done that.